you know, the best way to forget your troubles, have a trip down memory lane. And I am really pleased to say we've got, well, we're going to talk good times. That's all I know. We've got Tony Cotty on and, uh, well, we'll get him in. Let's uh, get the, let's get the ball going. It's time. Strap yourself in. Because we're set up, switched on and ready to go. You are watching and listening to Chris and Lester Till I Die TV on YouTube and your favourite podcasts. Leicester City. Tune in and join in now. And now, here's your host. Hi, Chris. Tony, good evening. How the devil are you? How are you doing, Chris? Yeah, I'm okay, thanks. Um, I suppose like uh, all Leicester fans, uh, not, not overly happy at the moment, but um, I'm sure we'll have a little chat about that. But it, it wasn't the best of results yesterday, Chris, was it? Let's put it that way. Not, not at all. And um, I am... Uh, my, my my psychiatrist says it is good to talk about these things, so we'll soon find out. Um, <laughs> Ray Ray says hello, and Doug says hi. Tony Crotch was one of my favourites on Sky. Um, well, nice to have you in, both of you, uh, at the start. Tony, I mean, the obvious place we always start with these sort of things is how did you get into football? Um, just like most kids, really, Chris. I mean, I was playing local football. I'm, I'm very much an Essex boy. I was playing in the, the town of Romford. Um, started playing as a six, seven-year-old and uh, realised very quickly I could do something that the other kids couldn't do, which was to put the ball in the back of the net. So um, I was always a forward. I always loved playing as a forward. always loved scoring goals. <laughs> I've scored um, I scored 99 goals as, a, uh, as an under-10 so um, wow. I think it was fair to say that I sort of knew where the goal was, which was which was great. And I, I, I had, you know, a great time growing up in the Essex area. But, you know, it's all a little bit different nowadays. I'm sure, we you know, there's a wonderful academy at Leicester and I'm sure they'll be looking at players that are, what, six, seven, eight years of age nowadays. But I, I had to wait until I was 12 before I got spotted by West Ham. And, uh, and that was it. I, obviously, I signed for my local team and, um, and progressed through the ranks. I was going to say that they were your team you supported from from the start, were they, West Ham? Yeah, absolutely, Chris. And you know, I, I think it's it doesn't matter what club you support. I, I I think you're pretty much sort of brainwashed as a kid, aren't you? You yeah, I'm sure as mo many many Leicester fans listening to this would say the same thing that you, you you have your children, particularly when you have your son, and you you try and encourage your son to be a Leicester fan and. I was no different. You know, where I was brought up, my, my mum and dad were West Ham, my nans and grandnans, my aunts and uncles, everyone around me was a West Ham fan. So I pretty much didn't have much choice. I had to support West Ham. And of course, when you then get the opportunity to play for your local club, that, that makes it even all the more special. You know, there's a yeah. few youngsters who've come through Leicester recently who, who actually support Leicester. And I always think it's good to have players playing for your club that actually support the club. It, all, it always feels that bit better when they do well, doesn't it? Uh, no, it's very true. I mean, I've got four kids, but when my first one, who is the, out of the four of them, he, well, there's two boys and he is the mad footballer. But we were growing up in Burnley and I did say to him, I said, right, you know, I don't mind if you support Burnley because they're your local team. You can support Leicester because they're your dad's team. That's how I'd like you to support. But you're not really well sporting Chelsea, Man United, Liverpool, just because you watch them on the TV. Yeah, or, I or think ways, Chris, you should always either, either support your dad's team or support your local team. That's always yes. been my belief. You know, I never yeah. quite get it. I, obviously, I'm, I'm living 
in the Essex London area. And I never quite get it when someone says, oh, I support Man United. And you think, well, why do you support Man United? It's 250 miles away, you know. I think you should, you know, support your local team or your dad's team. Yeah. Talking of supporting your local team, Mike is in good evening. I'm a Welsh person supporting Man United. It'll kill me for saying that. <laughs> um, but, um, well, we couldn't, he could, I mean, he, to be honest with you, I think Burnley at that point were known as Burnley nil. So I don't think he was ever going to uh, follow, follow Burnley. But I mean, it, it went well, so well for you at West Ham, didn't it? I mean, you were there, was it, I'm just looking here, uh, 10 seasons? Yep, I had two, I had two spells, Chris. I, I, I started at West hmm. Ham and sort of very much made my name at West Ham. I, I was in... You know, I made my debut at 17. I was in the first team as a regular from 18. So I had some fantastic years at my club. Um, we finished third in 1986 and never really built on the success we had that season. I got a bit frustrated. A few players left. So I ended up signing for Everton as a record transfer in 1988. I was there for six years. And then mm -hmm. I ended up going back to, to West Ham for two years. So, yeah, in total, I had nine years at the club. So, it's, you know, I'm very proud of the fact I played for my local club for nine years. Yeah. Rob there for Tremaine. You can guess who he supports. Um, I, to be honest with you, I, I don't really know. He's a stalker. He follows me around everywhere. But he has, no, he's asked me to say, he, his memory of you, his first memory of you was uh, on the 20th, even remembers the date, 25th of October, 1983. It was a Milk Cup game. You beat Berry 10-0. And uh, you got four goals scored, in that. Four goals. Scored four goals. I remember it really well, Chris. Yeah, I mean, it was, it's still West Ham's record ever win, 10-0. They've, they've not won 10-0 since or before. So that still stands, that record. And obviously for me as an 18-year-old to score four goals in the game mm. was a wonderful memory. Yeah. I mean, you haven't still got your boots, have you? I mean, we could do with you down, <laughs> down the King Power. You the, the one thing you don't need is me at the moment, Lester. You've got Jamie Vardy, you've got Pat Sandaka, you've got Ian Acho, <laughs> you've got some, an abundance of goal-scoring midfield players. You don't need me at the age of 57 <laughs> to come out of retirement. It's not that bad. I think the, the problems might be at the other end of the field, Chris. I don't think going forward <laughs> it's too bad. Well, knowing Brendan with your height, he'd put you in. Uh, he'd put you in defence. But hey, no, I'm not saying that. I mean, we said West Ham were your team, so moving to Everton, how was it? A you know a wrench for you? Did you not want to go? Or no, it, 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 no, it was far from that. I mean, at the time we're we're talking 1988. Um, I was a British record transfer, and <clears throat> I had two options. I could either sign for Arsenal or Everton, and. I think most people, and to be fair, even myself, really, when I first knew of the two clubs, I, I just thought, well, it's, Arsenal was a London club. It was easy for me to move across London. And I think most yeah. people felt that that was where I was going to go. But, you know, once you've got a choice, you, you talk to the two managers and you listen to their plans and what they want you to do. And um, Colin Harvey, uh, the, George Graham was Arsenal manager and Colin Harvey was Everton manager. And, and uh, Colin, I just felt Colin wanted me more at the football club. And, you know, I wanted to go to Everton to score goals and hopefully try and win something. I, I, I didn't win anything. I had to wait until my Leicester years, as I'm sure we'll come on. Funny to enough, before, funny enough. I, I, I've before, got that down. <laughs> uh, before I won anything, I had to wait for a good old Leicester to bail me out. But, um, yeah, no, I, I, I had a great time at Everton. I mean, it was it was 250 miles from Essex. So it was a it was it was a wrench from the point of view of obviously leaving home and going up to living somewhere that you didn't know where you were. But um, no, I had wonderful years there, and just the, the shame of it was I didn't win anything, you know. But I, it wasn't for the for the want of trying. No, I'm just looking. At, I mean, just yeah, just over two million, and that was a British record transfer. My God, those days seem a long way ago. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, you look at the, the amount of money players are going for now. I mean, um, obviously, the, the, the star player at West Ham at the moment is a young lad called Declan Rice, and he's the same age oh, okay. that I, I was when I moved to Everton. Declan's now 23, same age, and their, their quoting prices are between 100 and 150 million. So I think that's probably called inflation, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably. Uh, Forge from Iron says, uh, so both TC and Macca body swerved Arsenal. Uh, you never knew. And, and Jamie Vardy and Tielemans and Madison. I mean, we, we could just go on and on with the uh, players that have avoided Arsenal. Um, and then how come with the move uh, for, you know, back to West Ham game available? Well, it, it was something that I didn't really think was going to happen. But um, and, you know, once it became clear that um, 
Uh, I had three managers at Ever uh, Everton. I had Colin Harvey signed me. Howard Kendall was my second manager, who was brilliant. And then he resigned and Mike Walker took over. Uh, everyone will remember Mike Walker from the Norwich days. And uh, we didn't really see eye to eye, to be honest, which listen, it happens with managers. Sometimes you don't yeah. get on with them. And uh, once it became clear that I was going to be leaving, I, I obviously wanted to come back to London and to Essex, where my family was. And um, I, I was just fortunate, really, that West Ham came back in for me. It'd been six years since I'd left. I think there was a little bit of um, unhappiness with me, you know, where I left the club, which, I listen, I understand. You know, it's, as a fan, you can't change yeah. your colours. And, you know, sometimes if you have a favourite player and he leaves, you get disappointed and upset with them. I understood all that. But I think where there was six years in between the two spells, I think by the time I came back, the, the fans were, um, were were ready for my return. And I had a good time there, Chris. I, I had two seasons. Yeah. I was top scorer. And, you know, I, I sort of came back to West Ham really to finish my career. I was 29 when I signed for them and 31 when I left to go to Malaysia. So, it, you know, Malaysia was never in the plans, quite obviously. But, <laughs> I, was gonna, uh, I was gonna come on to Malaysia. I mean, yeah, it, 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 when you're planning your career, when you're starting out, I wouldn't have thought Malaysia would have been sort of in there. Maybe America, but but definitely not Malaysia. Yeah. No, I, I mean, as, as I always say, it's a lovely place to go for a holiday, but not so much to play football. Um, I don't really know what happened. As I say, I was top scorer for two years. Um, Harry Redknapp was the manager at West Ham. He, he, he signed a lot of uh, foreign players that came into the club in the mid-90s. And I got injured. And all of a sudden, I was sort of like a fifth or sixth choice striker. And more importantly, mm. West Ham had spent all their money and they needed money coming into the club to balance the books. And one of their main assets that they had was me. Um, but yeah. instead of signing for an English club, uh, I, I, the only club really who came in for me was a team called Selangor in Malaysia. And, um, you know, I, 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 as far as I know, I think there was a little bit of interest from QPR, but no one really wanted to wanted to buy me. And, you know, I found it a bit strange because, I, as I say, I'd been top scorer in the Premier League for the previous two seasons. I was only 31 years of age. If you look at Jamie now, he's, what, 35, yes. 36, still banging the goals in. So... You know, it was I, I could never quite get my head around the fact that no one's wanted to take a chance on me. And of course, you know, I had to wait for my return from Malaysia for someone to take a chance and believe in me. I mean, Ant says there, Ant's uh, Leicester Football uh, fan channel, uh, another Leicester channel. It's a great, a great channel, guys, if you're not sub to that. Uh, away from football, what was Malaysia like to live in? Yeah, very hot. <laughs> I think anyone who's, watching, anyone who's been to the Far East or um, if you say been to the Caribbean or to Florida and you, you know that intense heat with torrential rain at times and mm. it's exactly what it was like. You know, it was, it was, it was a real uh, eye-opening life experience, to be honest with you. You know, I, I don't regret going there. It was a great experience. Um, but... Ultimately, from a football point of view, and I was, you know, first and foremost, I was a professional footballer. I wasn't being fulfilled with my my football exploits over there. It was the, the league was only four years into being professional compared to the the UK, which was 110 years professional. Yeah. So obviously, there was a big difference between Malaysian and English football. And uh, to be honest with you, I missed English football, and uh, you know, I'm very much a home boy. I love being in England, and I, I just really wanted to come home, but. Of course, the problem I had is like when I left, no one wanted me. And of course, when you're coming back from Malaysia, I'm thinking if no one wants me on the way out, they're not going to want me on the way back. And, uh, you know, I was very worried about, you know, where I could possibly go and play. And, you know, I was, I was more than happy to drop down a few leagues. You know, I mean, my local clubs, I've got South End here, Orient, Colchester, mm, you know, yeah. really good lower league clubs that I could have gone and played for. But, you know, never, ever in my wildest dreams did I expect Leicester City to come calling. Well, I mean, I, how did that come around? Because it's like, like you say, you're on the other side of the world. Um, you, in fairness, you're probably out of a few people's minds. And I don't mean that horribly, but, you know, yeah. because of where it was. Um, I mean, we all know Martin O'Neill didn't like to do things the normal way. But how did that all come about? Well, the, 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 the person I've got to thank, uh, Chris, is Steve Walford. Now, those of you with long enough ah. memories will remember that Steve Walford yeah. was Martin O'Neill's coach, along with John Robertson. Yeah. But more importantly, yeah. Steve was a, a teammate of mine at West Ham. In my early days, when I was an 18-year-old kid, Steve was in the first team with me. And at the time, my, my dad was an insurance broker. So my job was to go into the training ground and try and get as many of the lads to get their car and house insurance with my dad as possible. Yeah. 
And one yeah. of the pe- one of the people that I managed to convince was Steve Warford. So anyway, uh, Wally signed up with my dad. This would have been what eighty three, eighty four, a long time ago. And then if you fast forward fourteen years, Wally is still doing his car insurance and his house insurance with my dad. And the, the conversation one day would just came from Wally. You know, how's Tony doing in Malaysia? And my dad said, well, he's not very happy. He wants to come home. You know, he's struggling to get a club type of thing. And Wally just said, well, let me speak to Martin O'Neill. He said, we've just won the, what was the League Cup in 1997. Yeah. Um, we've qualified for Europe and we need to increase our squad. We, You know, they didn't have the squad numbers there to compete in Europe. Um, so anyway, my dad relayed this message on to me and I started laughing. I went, Dad, I said, I, I love Wally to bits, but... I can't see in a million years Martin O'Neill was going to want to take a chance on me. Little did I know. And, of course, by the time I flew back to the UK, um, I very quickly drove up the the M1 to Watford Gap Services, a service station I'm sure the fans will know very well that on their yeah. travels down towards London. And I just sat there with with both Martin and Steve Walford, had a chat, and uh, we, we literally agreed the the contract I was going to sign it was on, on it was on a serviette in Watford Gap Services. So I was just um, about to say was it on the back of a, a, a pack of twenty yeah, fags because that's yeah, yeah, it was very similar to that. And of course, this is only twenty five years ago, Chris. It's not that long ago, but yeah. I think I think I trusted Martin that he would honour what he said, and he obviously mm-hmm. wanted to sign me as a as a squad player. And he made that quite clear. He said, "Look, we've got Heskey, we've got Claridge, we've got Marshall. I think they just yeah. signed Graham Fenton as well. So there was like four forwards yeah. there." And he said, look, if you're good enough and you can convince me, you'll get in the first team. He said, if you don't do that, you won't be in the first team. It was very simple. Yeah. And, and did you, I mean, obviously you were pleased to, to accept that and come back. Um, did you look at the competition and think, yeah, I can beat them? Well, I, I did in my mind. Um, yeah. In my mind, I was always, the one thing you've got to have as a footballer, Chris, you've got to be confident. <laughs> you've got to believe in your own ability. And I, that was something I never, ever struggled with. I, I always knew that I could score goals. Um, I could play on, on my day, you know, not every game, not everyone can play well in every game, but on my day, I, I knew I was a, a decent player. I was 32 years of age by the time I came back to Leicester. So I knew that time was against me a little bit. But what I didn't really realise is how unfit I'd become because I'd sort of pretty much wasted the 1996-97 season you know, I only played a few games for West Ham. Then I went to Malaysia. Then it was like a, a three-month pre-season where I didn't really do too much work. And it, it, I, I just lost a lot of my fitness. So, of course, by the time I came back and I started in training with the Leicester boys, you know, they'd all been playing Premier League football and I'd been playing out in Malaysia. So, I, you know, I, I'm the first to say I put my hands up. I was nowhere near fit enough. Not, 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 wasn't not good enough. I just wasn't no. fit to play in the first team. And, you know, I had a few battles with Martin and a few run-ins. I, that, that first six months was difficult for me. And, um, you know, I looked at um, moving up to Leicester, but I, I'd only signed a two-year deal. I was 32 years of age. My, my, my first wife at the time was pregnant with twins and my daughter was at school. So it was very sort of difficult for me to commit and yeah. go and live in Leicester. As nice a place as it was, we found some lovely houses, but I didn't want to commit if I wasn't going to be in the team. Yeah. And of course, Six months into my contract, you know, I hadn't even started the first team game. So, um, you know, from that point of view, I probably made the right decision in terms of, of where I was living. But it also meant I was commuting up the motorway every morning. I'm on the M25 and the M1 driving up to Leicester. You couldn't do it now because of the traffic. But 25 yeah. years ago, I just about got away with doing it. I'm going to say that's a fair, fair old commute for every day, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was two hours up and two hours back. I mean, obviously, you got a day off on a Wednesday or after a reserve game or whatever it might yeah. be, but it was still tough sometimes, you know, to be driving up and driving back. And of course, as as an end product for any footballer, the one thing you want to do is you want to play on a Saturday. And of course, if you if you draw, if you're doing all the travelling and you're playing, it's not a problem. But of course, that first season. I was very much in and out of the team and uh, come the end of that first season, it, it, you know, you sort of scratching your head, you know, is it worth it for me to keep doing the commuting and everything? It, it was hard from that point of view. Uh, do you remember your first game for Leicester uh, in the first team? Yeah, well, the, the, my first official appearance, I think, was in the, the famous 3-3 free, free draw at Filbert Street when Dennis Bergkamp tore yeah. Matt Elliott apart, something that we constantly remind him of, obviously. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, Bergkamp Berg was absolutely unplayable that day. You know, he was fantastic and he, he scored his goals, didn't he? 
Um, yeah. I, I just remember at the end of the game, for whatever reason, Walshy and uh, Ian Wright were trying to kill each other. And for some <laughs> reason, I just ended up in between a pair of them. I don't know why, but I'm sort of in between a pair of them trying to separate them. And, and that was my sort of first introduction. But, you know, I had quite a few substitute appearances. And then I think I then my first start was at Grimsby in the League Cup. I don't know whether you went to that game, Chris, but, you know, we was, we was defending champions in terms of the League Cup and we lost 3-0, 3-1, whatever it was. And uh, I, I remember, I remember the I remember the result, but I didn't yeah, go. But uh, who the, knew what after, was to come after the game? Martin O'Neill made it quite clear that he wasn't happy, not just with the team's performance, but with my performance. And as a result of that, I ended up going out on loan to Birmingham for five weeks. Yeah, and, and uh, it's great that you mentioned that Arsenal game because we've got a big Arsenal fan in the chat, Anthony Herbert. I'm sure Anthony, in reply to your question, his favourite game was that three-three against Arsenal. I bet it was. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I bet he was. And there was some great goals from Bergkamp in that. I mean, the one that he took over Elliot, you know, it was just like, he left yeah, him. It was, it was Gazaresque, wasn't it? Let's be honest. But I, I always ask, because I, 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 sort of, I, I chat with Steve Walsh and we've had him on here and what have you. And I always say, I said to him once that, would you have hit him? If you'd got, you know, if you'd got to him, and they said there was too many people holding them back that I don't think they would have even got to each other. But it looked, yeah, yeah. it looked good. It looked good on the TV. Exactly, I know. It was a very passionate night. Yeah, yeah. Still is, still is. In in fairness to him, um, you, you mentioned it earlier, so it's only fair that I do. Um, many great years at West Ham. Many great years at Everton. But there was only one club where you actually managed to win something, and yep. that, that was, <laughs> it wasn't the second. It wasn't the second time because we we were under Martin. I mean that up until recent was amazing years. You know we were mid table in the Premier League. We were you know in three finals in four years. We won two of them. Um, we didn't know it'd be that, <laughs> that long again till we'd be back there, but. Uh, First of all, the, the one before, we, 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 when we lost to Tottenham. Um, and I, 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 the thing I remember sticks out about that is, uh, uh, was it um, just in Edinburgh getting sent off? Yeah, with Robbie Savage. So we had a bit yes. of a, yeah. can't call it a scrap, but a little bit of an altercation. And of course, when, when Tottenham went down to 10 men, Chris, we, you know, we as players, and I'm sure all the fans thought, well, that's it. You know, we're going to win the game now. And it, it was a poor final. It really was a poor final. There was very, very few chances. I think I had one sort of half chance that Ian Walker saved. Um, but it, it, there wasn't a lot going on in the game. And of course, it was just meandering slowly towards extra time. At which point we just thought, well, with the extra man, you know, we're going to make that count in extra time. So we wasn't worried about the game going to extra time. That wasn't a problem. Um, mm. But of course, we switched off and Spurs broke. And um, was it, I can't remember who it was, was it Nielsen or Everson? I can't remember who scored the goal. Nielsen, I think. But, yeah, yeah, Nielsen, I think you're right. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, the thing from my point of view, I mean, obviously it was it was it was very sad for everyone. It was sad for all the Leicester fans to lose. It was sad mm. for all my teammates to lose. Um, but from my point of view, you know, I'd, I'd worked so hard as a footballer to to play in finals, and I'd played in four finals previous to that. Uh, sorry, three finals previous mm. to that, and I'd lost all three finals at Wembley, an FA Cup, and two Simul Cup finals. Uh, it was my full final. And then, of course, to lose to Spurs. And, you know, me and Spurs, I don't particularly like Spurs being a West Ham fan, obviously. Yeah. And, um, you know, to lose we'll to allow them, that. Yeah, to, to lose to them, it was just very, it was very frustrating. And, and I was upset and I, I couldn't control myself. And I'm, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I just stood on the pitch. I was holding, you know, my, my head like that and didn't know what to do. And um, I remember Ian Marshall, Ian Marshall was great. Come up to me, give me a cuddle. Come on, we'd, you know, we'd, we'd be fine, TC and all that stuff. And Ian Walker, to be fair, said the same. And I went, I was just, I just look, leave me alone, go away, leave me alone sort of thing. And then all of a sudden I just had this arm around my shoulder and I thought, oh, who the hell is this now? You know, just leave me alone. Yeah. And, uh, and I heard the voice. And as soon as you heard the voice, I didn't need to look, I knew it was. And it was, it was the gaffer, Martin, yeah. And he said, he said, don't worry. He said, I promise you we'll be back next year. And I looked at him, I went, Gaffer, I said, I'm 33 years of age. I'd had a great season, Chris. I was top scorer. I was yeah. voted player of the year for Leicester, which I'm very proud of. Yeah. But I knew 
the, my age was against me. And, I, I you know, it, it's so hard to get to a final, whether it's League Cup, yeah. FA Cup or Europa, whatever it might be, it's so hard to get to a final. And I just I just didn't really believe what Martin had said to me, but he certainly believed it. And uh, he was true to his word because, like, we roll forward a year and there we were at Tranmere lifting the cup and, you know, one of the proudest moments of my football career was just lifting that League Cup and, and, and winning it the fifth time. Yeah, I, I was at that match, I must admit. Um, the typical last ego, well, we go ahead and then we let them back yep. into it. Some yep. things don't change. No. Um, and it was a strange game because we went into it as favourites, and that was something that Leicester didn't do that often. No, that's right. And, you know, I mean, Tranmere, I think they was the league below, wasn't they? I think they were yeah. the equivalent of the championship when we played them, you know, whereas the year before, Tottenham had been in, uh, you know, they was the favourites. And the, 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 the final before that I didn't play it was Middlesbrough, and Middlesbrough had, had a good team that year. So Leicester, you know, were, were always sort of underdogs, but going into the Tranmere game, it was the complete opposite. We was expected to win, you know, and I expected to win. You know, this is, I'm never going to get a better opportunity. With the greatest respect yeah. to Tranmere, I'm never going to get a better opportunity than this. But, you know, again, I, I, I've got to mention him. I've got to thank Matt Elliott for scoring the two goals and, you know, giving me one of the, one of the best, Best football days of my life. It was fantastic. And to celebrate, I remember being in the bath after the game, big communal bath with Alan Birchnell and Neil Lennon and the boys and just throwing the cup around. And then we done the, the tour of the city. And it was just a you know, fantastic time to be a Leicester player. It really was. And it must have, I'm, I'm not being sarcastic here, but having waited so long, it must have been great. Uh, a, a better feeling because of the wait. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely, and you know I've got um, I've got a fantastic picture. Uh, I've, I've, I've not got too much. If hard, well, I've got hardly any memorabilia in my house. I've got a little sort of small games room out the back, and there's there's a picture of me in my Leicester kit with my Leicester shirt, and I'm holding up the League Cup like that, and it's pride of place in my bar. And it's as I say, it, it quite simply was one of the greatest days of my football career. You don't mean that picture, do you? That's the one. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to show that, but again, you brought it up, and I thought it'd be rude not to. I, I just want to say a quick hello to Football versus Cancer to talk. Good evening, sir. If you've not followed him on Twitter and you've not uh, sub to his uh, YouTube channel, please do. It's all about, um, as you can see there, it says it all in the name, Football versus Cancer. We can't let it win. Go and show the guy your support. It's it's a great channel. Uh, sorry, Tony, I just wanted to, 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 to sort of get that in. But yeah, Matt Elliott, not a, not a bad uh, striker for a defender, was he? Well, no, he was one of my strike partners, wasn't he? I mean, I ended up at various times playing with... Uh... Matt Elliott with Marshy and with Steve Walsh as well. <laughs> and we was very fortunate. You know, we had a lot of really, really good players. We had a lot of good experienced players. And not only was they experienced, they could play centre half or centre forward. So, you know, at times, you know, Emil was injured. One of the guys come in, you know, Marshy was injured. Walshy came in. So, uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a real array of uh, players that I played with. Stan Collymore, of course, you know. So, yeah. you know, we, we had some good forwards and some really, really good experienced players at the time. We, we had a good team, you know, I always say to people, you know, when people sometimes, I, I, I find it a little bit, um, they, they were a bit dismissive of the Leicester team. And, you know, I think you mentioned the, the, the facts there, Chris, you know, up until obviously recently, there's been a great time for, for to be a Leicester fan, you know, the last six, seven years. But before that, you know, the period from 19, sort of 95 to 2000, you know, with the promotions and the, you know, the, 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 the League Cup victories and, Finishing in the top, you know, the top ten of the Premier League was it four seasons running? You know, it's yeah. it was, it, you know, with the team we had, we we had some good players. You know, yes, at times we got the ball forward quite, you know, quite quickly and directly, but there's nothing wrong with that. But we, you know, we had pretty much a team of internationals. Come the end of my time at Leicester, we had some really, really good players at the club. Uh, cheers for that, yeah, and cheers for that as well, Rob. Um, talking about Emil, I mean, it was the original Little and Large, wasn't it? <laughs> really. I, I, yeah, I don't know about the original. I think you could go back to Keegan and Toshak with that one. That was probably the original, but um, yeah. it, it, it worked. It worked for me. It worked for Emil, I think, and it worked certainly worked for Leicester. Um, you know, I, I mean, I love playing with him. He, I had three years up front um, with him, and he was just a baby. He was a kid when he first came into the team, and you know, I was the experienced striker. I'm in my thirties. Emil was like a teenager, going early twenties. 
And, you know, he was learning the game and went on to have a fabulous career playing at Liverpool, playing for England. Um, but he was exactly what I needed at that time. You know, as a, as a 33, 34-year-old, you don't want to be doing too much running. What you want to do is do what you're good at. And, I, you know, I'd like to think I was good at scoring goals, but I needed someone to do the hard, hard work and the graft for me. And that's where Emil come into it. And we had a great understanding. You know, he would go for the high, long balls, flick the headers on, I'd hold the ball up, he'll, he, or he'd go out wide. You know, there's quite a few goals where he drifted out wide, crossed the ball, and I'm in the middle to score. We had a really good understanding. I loved my time playing up front with him. Yeah. And I, I, I may be making this up, but I think maybe probably not from what you've just said. And I have I have quoted you as saying this, so I really do hope it's true, that the fact that it was Emil that did all the work, he did all the leg work, and you did all the grain work and got into the positions to be on the end of all his hard work. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think Emil knew that as well. <laughs> and, you know, that helped him develop as a player. You know, and it, listen, Emil could finish as well. He was a good finisher. Yeah. But he was he was learning his game. You, you know, as a as I say, as a 19, 20, 21 year old as he was when he was at Leicester, you know, you you are learning the game. And, I, you know, I, I'd like to think, you know, I know he's not on tonight, but if you ever speak to Emil, I'd like to think that he would say that I helped him and I passed on my experience because... When I was a young kid at West Ham, you know, breaking through and playing my games, I had players like that that were giving experience and advice to me. And that's that's what you try and do when you're a senior player. You try and help the youngsters. Yes. Um, but, I mean, a lot of people are coming in with questions, but I, I've, it's got a few sort of general ones of my own uh, that I found out about you. And one that Anthony said here, and he says, do you still have your scrapbook from your playing days? Yeah. And, yeah, I've still got the scrapbooks. They're, they're safely locked up in the loft, and I don't. Ref I'm, I'm not as sad to refer to them all the time, Chris. You know, every now and again, I get up in the loft and I sort of walk past them and think, "Oh, there they are," sort of thing. But um, yeah. yeah, I mean, they're they're there. There's a personal record from every, pretty much every game I played from the age of seven up to when I retired at 36. But as I say, I'd just like to play. I'm not as sad that I go up there and look at all the. I don't. I don't sit up there every night looking at all the scrapbooks. I just wanted to confirm that. No, 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 I can believe. But I mean, is it every goal or every game that you kept cuttings from? No, no, both. Uh, every every game, no. every game, every goal. And you know, my dad started it when I was seven years of age, and I just thought it was a it was a good idea and something nice to sort of you know just keep a record of what I achieved. So. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so sad that if you said to me when I was an under nine player, well, you know, who did you play in September when you was an under nine? I could go back and list yeah. the games and the goals. I, I won't do it to you tonight, Chris, I promise you. <laughs> well, your meal's ready at eight, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we haven't got time for that. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned this picture before and it's just um, coming up. I mean, it, it is one of these, those the iconic one. pictures, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And that's exactly like I say, you know, I'm I'm just thinking go away and Martin's, you know, he he sort of he, he he searched me out because, you know, I was standing on the eighteen yard box and Martin obviously would have been, you know, in the, the tunnel area on the halfway line. I'm pretty I don't know what he did because I just was in my wallowing yeah. my self pity and I don't know what he did, but I'm guessing he would have come on the pitch and he would have pretty much gone round to all all of the players, not just me, but all the players and said the same sort of thing to all the players. But uh, he got to me eventually, and it, I, I thought it was a really nice touch and a really good bit of man management for Martin. Yeah, and, and of course, we say just twelve months later. Um, I'm trying to find it now. Here we go. I've just gone past it. Twelve months later, celebrating. Yeah, there it is, Matt Elliott. having scored the goal, and uh, yeah, and I mean that was that was a, that was a great day for for us all. You know, not as I say, not it's not all about me. It was about Leicester winning the trophy and. Um, you know, it was it was, a, it was a wonderful day and it made up for the heartache of the year before because I think we was all so disappointed. You know, we let the fans down. We let ourselves down in 1999 against Spurs. And, you know, we had to put that right. And, you know, I'm pleased to say we did. Yeah. Um, another question that, 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 has, that has been asked, uh, but I, I've got written down here that, do, do you think if things hadn't worked out for you sort of in the, in the footballing sense that, you had a career in Hollywood ahead of you? Don't think so, Chris. I know where you're going with this. <laughs> I'm not subtle, am I? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. My, well, I had a very short acting appearance. This would have been, oh, what was it, about six years ago now. And uh, yeah. I appeared in the film called Final Score. So if you haven't seen it before, you don't know what you're missing. Um, I, I can tell you what you're missing. You're not missing a, a great deal. You, you, 
you'll see me get shot on screen and my acting's terrible. I just go back like that. And that's about, I don't, I don't particularly say anything in the film and uh, I just get shot by a terrorist. Um, and funny enough, I never got nominated for an Oscar, which I was quite yeah. disappointed about, but um, yeah, fully understandable that I didn't know. Sounds sound like one of those very good romantic comedies, but let's be honest with you. I, I, yeah, I might have had more chance with one of those. Yeah, you're no worse than uh, Gary Lineker in uh, Bend It Like Beckham. So. No, okay. exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, you did, obviously, I mean, going back again to West Ham, you won Young Player of the Year. You've, you've had... You know, you, you play around, you came back, you know, you, you went down a few, you, you flew, you flew up and we teeth in a few leagues and carried on playing. Uh, if you could take one memory away from everything that you've done, what, what, I, mean, I know it's hard probably because you've, you've got quite a few over, over the years, but what, what, what would that sort of one memory be? Uh, it, I, I don't think I could, I, I couldn't just nominate one memory, Chris, because mm -hmm. I think every yeah. club that you play for, you have. You have special memories, and you know, I've got special memories of West Ham and Everton, spe specifically with my debuts. Um, obviously, I played for England. You know, you look back and think, "Wow, I played seven times, only seven times, but it was seven times." So, yeah. you know, I look back with great fondness with those days. And you know, Leicester, we spoke about the Tranmere game, but I think one of my best memories really was scoring my two hundredth league goal for Leicester. And you know, the the, the week mm. before we played at Wembley, we lost to Spurs. And, you know, everyone wanted to put that right. We played at White Hart Lane. I think they paraded the trophy around the pitch beforehand and all that rubbish. And we just wanted to go out and, and you know, and put, put one over them. And yeah. um, what was great, we won the game 2-0 and I scored. And when I scored, it was my 200th league goal. And that, that was a great feeling, a great buzz for me yeah. after the disappointment of the week before. Um, you know, the... Uh, the other things, highlights of my Leicester career. I mean, obviously, scoring at Old Trafford and when we won 1-0 mm -hmm. in 1998 was an incredible day for, for me and my family and all the fans. That I, I'm, over the years, every Leicester fan that comes up to me, wherever I might be, they always say they was at that game. Now, I'm yeah. pretty certain it was about 25,000 Leicester fans. <laughs> I know there wasn't. It was probably more like 5,000 there, but it feels like there were 25,000. And I mean, that was a special memory. And I, I think the two the two Sunderland Cup semi-finals as well, before the Tottenham final, you know, I was at the peak of my powers, if you like, playing for Leicester. You know, as I said, I had a great season. I scored two at uh, Stadium Light and then I scored one at Filbert Street to help us through to Wembley. So, you know, it, 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 as I say, you've asked me to name one thing. It, it's, it's too many great things that happened to me, particularly at Leicester, that... You know, to just name one thing. No, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say that my, 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 you know, one memory more than any other of yourself is that goal at Filbert Street. Because I think that was the return leg, wasn't it? Yeah, so, yeah, the semi final yeah. there. We was two, we won two one in the first leg, and then yeah. uh, I think I'm, I think I'm right in saying Sun. I think Sunland scored and made it two all they, on, on aggregate. Yes, so we we needed a goal, and they, you know this was a good Sunland team. They had Quinny and Phillips up front, and good players in their team and then you know for me to score that goal it was it was I, I got a real buzz out of the goal you, you see me with my celebrations I've done the old Mick Shannon celebration and it was it, it was a great yeah. night really it really was yeah you got to enjoy those nights haven't of you, you have. of yeah you have. and I know the total football wants to start stalking you but he says where did you live when you played for Everton uh, I, well, obviously with Everton, I, I had to move up to Everton. Uh, it was 250 miles away. Leicester was about 110, so I, yeah. I, I just about got away with it. But I lived in um, Birkdale, which everyone who, and certainly anyone who's a golfing fan will know that there's Royal Birkdale Golf Course. And I lived about a mile around the corner from there. And then it was about a half an hour drive to Merseyside to get to Goodison Park. Right. Uh, Rob says again here, I'm interviewing David Cross, uh, who was our record signing in 77 for 180,000. It's true that, though. Now that is some player's weekly wage. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's what I always say nowadays, Chris. You know, we earn in a in a year what they earn in a week now. You know, good luck to the players. Here. You know, take it while you can. David yeah. Cross, by the way, is a lovely man and one of our heroes. Played for West Ham, of course, back in the yes. late 70s. And he was a top player. Yeah. Um Mike says, best player Tony has played alongside and best player he's played against. Wow. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, it was, there was a lot of good players at Leicester. I mean, I, I think technically Muzzy is it was probably the, the best Leicester player I played alongside. Um, yeah. You know, he was fantastic. We had lots of players that were good at doing their jobs, but I think Muzzy just had that little bit of quality and that different bit of skill that he could bring to the table. Um, you know, Playing against, wow, um, I mean, 
I remember playing against Rude Hullet when he first arrived in the Premier League, back around about 94, 95, thinking, wow, how's this guy, you know, that I'd seen scoring for, you know, Holland in the 1988 Euro final, all of a sudden, a guy that, you know, t- 10 years previous, you never would have had Rude Hullet playing in the Premier League. And no. then here he was playing for Chelsea and yeah. I'm playing against him. And then Viali arrived from Italy and all these Zola and all these wonderful players. So, um, yeah, I mean, there were some tremendous players, a lot, lot of good Arsenal players as well. So, yeah, you know, there's probably too many to name, but I, I think the arrival of Rude Hullet for me was a sort of a big one. Mm. And uh, what question about manager? I think, you know, you've worked with some great managers, Howard Kendall um, uh, uh, and obviously Martin O'Neill. Uh, would you include Peter Taylor? I'm sorry, that's a horrible I question know, to ask I you. Being, I know you've been flipping about it, but um, <laughs> yeah, the thing with Pete, yeah, let, listen, I actually, I've known Pete a long time and, um, you know, we laugh and joke about it now, but I, I think the problem was is that when Peter took over at Leicester, um, he, he very successfully managed the England under 21. Yes. He yes, was used yeah. to dealing with uh, younger players and of course when he went to Leicester he had a lot of senior players you know in their 30s the likes of me Marshy, Stan, Walshy, mm. Elliot you know see very senior players very powerful players and uh, I, I think that made it a slightly difficult dressing room in many respects if you're trying to bring young players through obviously um, yeah. but I, mean, I think one of my greatest regrets really is that um, that the club didn't give me and Steve Walsh the chance to, to take over as, as manager and an assistant manager, which was the plan. Um, you know, we was interviewed by the club and I, I think we genuinely, I think we surprised the ball that when we sat down and done the interview, I, I, I don't know what they was expecting or thinking, but me and Walsh, done a proper presentation. You know, we had all these plans. We named players we was going to sign to bring to the club. And, uh, I remember Andy Neville, uh, I think still at the club, isn't he, Andy Neville? And, um, you know, he mm-hmm. said, like, we, you know, you, you really surprised the ball. But unfortunately, I think they'd already made the decision to bring Peter Taylor in. And, of course, as soon as Peter arrived, you know, I knew I'd be leaving. And, you know, I left pretty much about, I think, about a week after Walshy left. And it was the breakup of what was a really good team in the late 90s. It, it, unfortunately, yeah, it happens and, and it goes on. Um, yeah, absolutely. Rob again says, what was your favourite goal for West Ham and Leicester? Um, favourite goal for West Ham, probably my debut goal as a 17-year-old, you know, to score mm. against Spurs. That was a special moment for me. I know I scored lots of goals after, but yeah, it, that was a really, really memorable one for me as a West Ham fan. And favourite goal for Leicester, I think I've already touched on it, Chris. It's got to be the goal at Old Trafford because yes. you know, I started the game, I scored the only goal, and it really... It gave me the confidence to to start performing again in the Premier League and to do what I did. You know, I, I had two and a half years after that goal went in, scoring goals in the Premier League for Leicester. And I think without that goal at Old Trafford, I never would have done that. Yeah, and of course, in those days, it was a lot harder to score against Man United at Old Trafford. Course, Did I say yeah. that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> so, I was thinking that. I didn't realise I was saying it at the same time. Uh, Mike says, what current football player do you uh, represent close to yourself in playing style? Um, well, I, I, I don't think there's too many sort of out-and-out goal scorers nowadays, is there? I mean, Erling Haaland is definitely an out-and-out goal scorer, but he's six foot four, so you definitely can't compare me with him. Um, <laughs> yeah. You've got Jesus, uh, Arsenal, and again, uh, you know, uh, he's probably not just an out-and-out goal scorer. I think... Probably two players that have um, one's just left the Premier League and one's just retired from football that you could probably um, say that I was sort of similar to one. The, the one that's just retired is Jermaine Defoe, who I thought was a fabulous goal scorer. He yeah. played in Scotland, obviously, towards the end of his career. He's just retired. And uh, yeah. uh, there was a lad at Man City who wasn't a bad goal scorer, and that was called Sergio Aguero. Very small, stocky type of player. And you know, um, he got the odd one, think, didn't he? Yeah, I think all three of us really, really enjoyed that buzz of scoring goals. You know, proper, mm. proper out and out goal scorers. Now, this was something I didn't know, but I can say, in fairness, Rob, Rob is the West Ham fan. But um, is, is he says Tony's the last, and unless rules have changed, we'll be the last player to play a match in each of the four pro divisions in the same season. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, it's, I think it's a record, Chris, that's going to stand forever more because, as we all know now, you now get the transfer window. So the most clubs you can play for is three. So even if you played in three different divisions, three different clubs, it wouldn't be the same as four, obviously. So, uh, yeah, I did it in the 2000-2001 season. 
it's not a record I'm particularly pleased and proud about. Bearing in mind, I started the, the you know the, the season I started at Leicester in the Premier League and ended up at Millwall in League One. So it's not really a record to be proud of, but it no. is a record that I think could possibly stand forevermore. Yeah. Uh, and moving on then, just to, 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 to finish on this, I mean, you, I know you'd sort of, you cover some games. I don't know if you've covered any this season yet for, for Leicester. Yeah, but, but I, was um, Chelsea, I was at the Chelsea-Leicester game doing the commentary. Now, that to me, see, I don't know what to make of this season because when you look at the performance that we had um, just against uh, um, Brighton, and when you look at the performance we had against, I know we didn't we didn't beat Chelsea, but it's so up and down. I mean, you know, and without getting, I don't want to get you know to turn anything controversial here, but you know. Are the players getting confused, do you think, about what they should be doing and where they should be doing it? Well, I don't think they should be confused. I mean, I agree with what you said. You know, Chelsea, there was a lot of positives to take out of the performance and really they should have got at least a draw, if not won the game, you know, particularly with Chelsea being down to 10 men. Um, yeah. I didn't see the game live yesterday. Um, I only saw the highlights. I mean, you can see I've, got, I've actually got my Leicester shirt on. As you can see, I've just finished, in, finished doing my, my stuff for LCFC TV, which I... I love being a part of what's going on at Leicester. And, you know, I've just been working with Matt Matt Elliott and Ewan Roberts and we're all sort of scratching our heads a little bit, trying to explain why it's been such a difficult start to the season. But I think football is a game of basics, Chris. And the the one thing you cannot deny at the moment is Leicester are conceding too many goals. You know, they've conceded 16 goals. The only team that's conceded more is Bournemouth and they lost nine at Liverpool, as we all know. So I think... You know, it's something that the, the, the players and, and the managers, and it's not just about the defence, it's about the whole team. You've got to defend properly. Um, they still score two goals away from home. So, you, you know, there's an argument there that you should be getting at least a point if you're scoring two goals at Brighton. Tough place to go to. But if you're going to concede five, it could easily have been six with McAllister's goal of the yeah. season that got wiped out. Yeah. Um, you know, the... the, the you can't get away from the facts. They're conceding too many goals. Now, how you put that right is down to the manager, down to, particularly down to the players, picking the right system and everyone doing their job properly. You know, they've got some tough games coming up. You've got Villa Villa coming up. It's going to be tough. You know, they've just yeah. picked up. They've got a good result against City. You know, Stevie G's got points to prove. you then got Tottenham away. You know how hard that's going to be that game. So, you know, there's no time to feel sorry for yourself in the Premier League. You've got to pick yourself up, dust yourself down, where you go. And they've just got to get that first win. I think if we get a first win against Villa, then you will see a different Leicester going forward. It is. You know, you just need that ball to go in off somebody's backside, don't you? And give them a 1-0 win. Well, well, yeah, yeah. 1-0 win would be great. But, but, of course, if you're not defending well, Chris, and this is my point, if you're not def- if you keep yeah. conceding goals, there have been goals pretty much, I think, is it every game? I think they've conceded in every game. And if you're conceding too many goals, you, you cannot win football matches because it becomes too hard. Yeah, and I mean behind the scenes, there's a lot of you know you know we know about the UEFA FFP and all that. I mean, Top is doing the best he can, um, and and he's doing it right. If you know if these cutbacks have got to be made, I'd sooner finish seventeenth and have a club next season than be like Derby County and be fined and get relegated. And it, he's got a difficult job <coughs> on his hands to try and balance the books with the way things are going. Yeah, of course. And, you know, although it was disappointing, at least the 70 million coming in for Fana should help to balance the books. But of course, you you balance the books and you lose one of your top defenders. So you you sort of lose on one hand and gain on the other. So it's all a little bit um, up in the air at the moment. But, you know, I I think it's important for Leicester fans to remember, you know, where they were 10 years ago. Um, Remember the success that they've had in the last 10 years, FA Cup, Community Shields. Premier Leagues, playing in yeah. Europe, Champions League football, you know, all these things have happened at Leicester. And, you know, when I was at Leicester, we had success. Yes, we did. But we, we only really won the League Cup, you know, limited success in, in Europe. Um, and never in our wildest dreams would, could you imagine Leicester winning the Premier League and playing in the Champions League. So I think sometimes, yes, of course, you need a little bit of a reality check. But, you know, I, I, my advice to the Leicester fans, don't get too down with things at the moment. It's still very, very early in the season. I still believe in Brendan Rodgers as a manager and I still believe that there's enough quality in this team to start winning football matches and at least get up to, hopefully, at least a mid-table uh, finish come the end of the season, which is obviously where Leicester have got to be looking. You've always got to be looking. After yeah. what they've achieved, they've got to be looking to be in the top 10 every season. 
I was going to look at just one last question to ask you, but one of them was VAR, and I thought, well, we could be here till half ten with that one. And, uh, you know what? Fish... My dinner's going to be on the table in five minutes, and five yeah. minutes is nowhere near enough to... I know, that's what I was thinking. Um, so, all, all, I will leave... all I will say, and I've said it publicly, and I'll say it to you, is I, I, actually, I actually believe in VAR. I think it can possibly be a good invention for the game, but it has to be interpreted properly, and I, I think there's too many referees, ex-referees that are sitting in Stockley Park, are twiddling their thumbs and trying to make names for themselves. They really don't need to do that. Let the game run itself. The referees are making decisions and they're trying to pick up on silly little things, offside by a toenail or things like that. You know, we, you know, I, I know, I know Leicester fans wouldn't have wanted to see it, but you can't say anything other than McAllister's goal yesterday was a goal of the season contender. Uh, let alone a goal of the month. Yes, it would have been 6-2 instead of 5-2, and I, I understand it all from a Leicester point of view. But are we really going to start disallowing goal of the season goals when someone's got a toenail offside? I mean, if we are, you know, that is ridiculous. And more to the point, and I'm sure anyone who was at the game yesterday, and there was thousands of Leicester fans, I'm sure they'll all agree, four and a half minutes deciding on whether he was offside or not is absolutely ridiculous. So, um, yes, keep VAR, but we need to tweak everything and we need to make it much more efficient. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully going forward, we won't have these stupid decisions. No. Tony, thank you so much. I'm conscious of the time that your dinner might be smoking in the oven. Thank you so much for coming on. Really Chris, appreciate it. Chris, you're welcome. And as I say to all Foxes fans, keep the faith. Hopefully they'll get a good result against Villa at the weekend. Pleasure Fingers to speak crossed. to you. Thanks a lot, Tony. All the best to yourself and your family. Take care. Cheers, Chris. Thanks, mate. All the best. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, thanks to Tony there. Lovely, lovely guy. His dinner is in the oven, so I do know he is rushing. I uh, don't know what he's having. I'm hungry myself, actually. Um, guys, that was Tony Cotty. What a what a nice, nice guy. Um, and, of course, let's say, let's never forget, he won his only major trophy. He won something. He won the FA Cup in Malaysia. It was the Malaysian FA Cup. He won his one trophy with Leicester. Not with West Ham, not with Everton, not even with Millwall. He did it with Leicester. Guys, we've got a new show coming up at nine. Sloppy seconds. Uh, Maisie is going to be joining me. We are going to be previewing and predicting the start of the WSL, the Women's Super League. Um, let's hope it, uh, it carries on. Let's hope we can be more successful with the women's than we are with the men's. <laughs> we, couldn't face it. we couldn't be any worse at the moment um, Anthony, thank you very much um, Good stream, Chris And get Tony Cotty on here is fantastic Cheers, mate Cheers, thank you very much um, I will see you all back here at 9 o'clock Hopefully with, with young Maisie And talking all things women's football Take care, stay safe And I'll see you in about ooh, 53 minutes Good night That's all, folks Thanks for watching Leicester Till I Die. This is Chris saying goodbye and see you next time. This week's episode has come to an end. But the fun doesn't have to stop here. If you have any questions, suggestions or feedback, head over right now to Twitter and Facebook and like, share and get involved. Join us next time. Till I Die TV. They think it's all over. It is now.